Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today's episode is dedicated to creating a vision. I like to think of this podcast as an ongoing, advanced study of reality creation. In this study, we consider every aspect, every teaching, every major teacher. We look at simulation theory and physics. We look at Neville Goddard and Joseph Murphy. We look at the Bible and we look at so many different resources. Our goal is to create our realities in the ways that we want to overcome the obstacles that we have in our life, to experience our wish fulfilled. And there is one important way to do that. And that is to create a vision of the reality that you want. The key things we've been discussing so far on the podcast is learning how the mind works, taking the mystery out of why you do what you do, learning to ride out stressful situations, and changing the concept you have of yourself. Your ability to ride out the fears, uncertainties, and doubts that cause the stress and anxiety is foundational to your ability to create reality. Your ability to change and reinvent yourself. Ultimately, however, to achieve the change that you desire, you must create a vision of what you want. And a lot of times people get stuck at this step. A vision is similar to a goal in that it provides something you want at some point in the future. Vision is in many ways loftier than a goal in that it is an ideal future state and excitement. It can give you meaning, purpose, a reason to exist. A strong vision will act as a template, a guide as to how you live your life. It leads to change, transformation, and in the end, reinventing yourself. When you set a large goal like a vision, you may experience anxiety and stress, causing you to hesitate. Recognize that this is natural, especially when taking actions aligned with your vision. Instead of hesitating, use the techniques that I've discussed so far in the podcast, such as writing out the discomfort associated with fear, doubts, or anxiety, or learning to be comfortable with the discomfort, knowing it will pass when you take action in line with your vision. A vision is the key requirement for growth and reinvention. It will require you to change. However, some people are reluctant to change, not necessarily out of fear, but because they will have to give up some secondary gain, the benefits of not facing or addressing a problem. What benefits do people get from staying locked in their current situations? Why would anyone be reluctant to improve their circumstances? The reasons turn out to be very complicated. I meet a lot of people that have goals and desires, wishes they want to have fulfilled and Guess what? In most cases, when it comes right down to it, they'd rather stay stuck in their present reality. As I've stated many times, one of the primary reasons people are reluctant to change, even though they are experiencing the pain of fear, stress, and anxiety, is that people are comfortable knowing what they know, doing what they do. I speak a little bit about this in my episode, discover your power as well as reinventing yourself people have created life principles and set up support structures to sustain their way of life remaining as they are is comfortable despite the problems they have the benefit of not changing is that people do not have to take responsibility for their lives they have learned that they can get others to do things for them they have learned that they sit comfortably at home because they will be taken care of. The sad thing is many people have chosen to be stuck and don't realize it. You may not like to do certain things, preferring to stay in a world that is familiar. To a degree, we all do this. However, being comfortable with the way things are becomes a problem 
when it keeps us from doing the things we know we should and can do. It's not just about being complacent. We stop growing. We wither. We die. I think of an example of a businesswoman I knew that was afraid to speak in public. She had learned how to maneuver in such a way that she gets others to make presentations for her. She structures events so others feel like it's about teamwork. So she's able to dodge the anxiety associated with preparing and making presentations. But she outsmarted herself. No one will know who she is and she won't progress. Later, she will wonder why she's passed over for promotions or sales. Another example is the person who wants to remain in the comfort zone. A young woman lives in a large city and has a fear of riding on trains. The inability to take a train in the city can be limiting. She now has an excuse not to go to college even though that was her goal. Of course, the reason sounds plausible. I can't attend college. I can't travel. I'm afraid of trains. Her rationale, it's not my fault, hides her real reason, the fear that she might flunk out. To feel better, she has surrounded herself with people who have a limited view of themselves. These new friends said, just go on government assistance and you can stay home. She accepted that path of least resistance, the comfort of staying in place. This reinforces the limited view she had of herself. I probably couldn't have finished college anyway. I'm not smart enough. The secondary benefits are she can sit home, be comfortable, and not put herself in any stressful situations. Even though the pressure of college would be temporary, her new friends have become a support structure, albeit a negative one. They rationalize her choice by telling her who needs that added pressure of college and the stress of studying and tests. The path of least resistance is a path to a meager existence, one that will have a lifetime of negative implications. Think about your situation. What are you avoiding? What fears are holding you back? Are you fearful of being ridiculed? Rejected? Of failing? Of not looking good? What are the secondary gains or benefits related for you to not move forward? Are you sitting comfortably? Are you around people who subtly discourage you from doing what you would like to do? What are you telling yourself? I have done this. I've surrounded myself with people that made me feel comfortable in that zone where I didn't get anything done. Sit around and drink and get high. Those are the people I surrounded myself and I didn't have to feel guilty because I had all this potential of things I can do. What are your excuses? Your excuses are a good indicator of what you may be avoiding. Is your excuse that you're too busy doing other things? Is your excuse that you have a demanding job? Is your excuse that you have kids? What are the excuses that keep you from doing the things necessary to give you what you want? What are the excuses and secondary gains you will have to give up if you create a vision of what you want and take the steps to achieve it? A vision is the key force to overcoming a limited self-concept and getting past the past and all the anxiety, fear, and self-doubts associated with it. It is difficult to get past the past without a vision to pull you forward. A strong vision gives you purpose, direction, and a reason to get up each morning. It provides a new way of being in the world. A vision of what you want pulls you towards it. It is a template, a blueprint, a guide for how to act in the present moment. You do not have to wait to reach the vision to become the person you wish to be. Use the vision as a blueprint of how to be that person now. Neville Goddard tells us to assume that the reality is happening now in the present moment in order for that to occur in our lives. Use the vision as the blueprint of how to be that person. Who do you need to become to achieve the vision? How would you act once you achieved it? What attributes and talents must you have? The blueprint becomes the stand from which you live. The vision is like the magnetic pull of true north in that it keeps you in line with what you want. It is bolstered by this critical question, is what I am about to do in alignment with my vision? And if the answer is no, then don't do it. 
This question alone will make you a very different person from the person you were yesterday. A vision of what you want should stretch you. On the way toward the vision, you become a different person because it encourages you to develop your talents. As you work toward your vision, you will have to develop new skills and tap into a new dimension of yourself. On the path to the vision, you will realize you can stretch yourself further by setting incremental objectives that are more difficult. Moreover, each time you stretch, you discover additional hidden talents, sharpen your skills and gain the experience to become the person you were meant to be. To become the person you were intended to be starts with a vision of what you want. To create your vision, it is useful to ask yourself these questions and write the answers in a journal or put it in notes on your phone. Ask yourself, what do you want to do with your life? What are you naturally inclined to do? What were you put on earth to do? What excites you? When you begin to answer these questions, you're actually describing a larger purpose for your life. The question then becomes, to what extent are you willing to commit to the vision? If you are serious about it, you have to let go of the limiting notions about yourself based on the past and step into the space between where you were a moment ago and that future state represented by that vision. This space between where you are now and where you are going is what we are calling the gap. You can check out my episode, Step Into The Gap. I talk about the gap a little bit in my episode, Discover Your Power. A lot of times I find that I'm coaching people or helping people in the gap between where they are now and where they want to be. In the case of the woman who had the fear of trains, her vision was, I want to receive a college degree. The space between where she is now, afraid of trains, no college degree, a meager existence, and her vision of what she wants, a college degree, is the gap. What she needs to do is make the commitment to achieve her vision, let go of the past, and then learn to live in the gap. This means she needs to step into the arena and learn to live in the arena of commitment and take the steps necessary that will allow her to cross the gap. The gap is where all the action takes place. Living in the gap is doing whatever is necessary to cross the gap, or as Neville Goddard liked to call it, the bridge of incidents that occur from your imaginary act to the fulfillment of your imagination. To get to the other side, to achieve the vision, the gap is the arena where you test your mettle by developing your skills and talents. The battle will be between your past pulling you back and your vision pulling you forward. Taking action in the gap will require the development of discipline and mastery as the past continues to come up as you face challenges. There are energetic imprints, patterns, and habits, traumas that occur from your past that are always just pulling you back into your present reality. You've identified with these things and they lock you into that place where you're not in the gap. The gap is the place for those who want to improve the situation that they are in and push past the past. Is that you? The issue is that people will come face to face with old concepts about themselves. I know I won't be able to do it. I know I'm too old. I know there's something wrong with me. I know I'm going to have a panic attack. I'm not as smart as other people. I'm not a good public speaker. I came from a poor family. I'm not meant to get ahead. This is just not for me. At the same time, they let go of these old concepts. They begin to let the vision govern their actions in the present moment. What the woman who has a fear of trains needs to do is sign up to take the college course in the face of the discomfort. She can face the discomfort by realizing it is only temporary. She needs to confront her fear of traveling by train. She needs to create a new structure of support by getting around like-minded people who want to go to college to better themselves. In the case of the person who is afraid of speaking in public, she needs to create a vision of being a good public speaker and then make presentations despite the fear that it might not go well. The critical issue for all of us 
is to pursue the vision in the face of fear of failure, in the face of possible rejection, and not give in to the pull of the comfort zone. We must then use these experiences as learning opportunities for mastery and the achievement of the vision. So what if you fail or make mistakes? Use the failure, mistakes, and rejection as feedback. They provide opportunities to figure out what more you need to learn and do to produce the result you want. The most important thing to do after you've created vision of what you want is to get into the arena. The arena is where you take action. It is only taking action that counts. Action is the ultimate form of prayer. The first step is always action. Face the fact that you may be avoiding taking action because of some fear you have, but are using some excuse not to move forward. Get into the habit of asking yourself, what am I not doing right now that I should be doing? It's that simple. The simplicity of the question provides insights that will surprise you. It is a powerful question to use any time you become stuck. Use your journal to see the truth. Let me ask it again. What are you not doing right now that you should be doing? The reason I'm so passionate about this is because for so long I created excuses to not act, to sit back and watch the world move along around me. I lost a decade of my life not doing what I love because I was afraid to move in to the gap and I don't want anybody else to face that. I want you to move into the gap. I want to tell you and I promise you that you can do this if you create a vision. So ask yourself, what are you not doing right now that you should be doing? After you answer that question, ask yourself, why am I not doing these things? You can recognize the avoidance when you take responsibility or you're making excuses. You cannot allow yourself to have excuses such as I am too old or I am too young. I have a fear of trains. They won't like me or I don't have a college degree. You have to deal with these excuses directly. Take the bull by the horns, deal with the excuse by facing them, and then take the action in spite of the excuses. You have to give up all the excuses, give up the secondary gains related to not facing your fear, and give up any benefit or payoff for not having your life work the way you want it to. You have to be willing to examine what you're fearful of such as the risk of failure and the risk of being criticized or rejected. So ask yourself, why am I fearful? What is stopping me? Yes, you may feel panicky and you may feel uncomfortable. It will feel risky. Yes, it may take you a while to do this, but stay with the discomfort for as long as you can and take the action. You have to learn not to avoid the excuses, the fears and the doubts. Get in the arena and take action. In the face of the excuses, fears, and doubts until they dissipate. Use the stress as an opportunity to ride out your discomfort in order to master the discomfort. Use the fear to master your fear. Put yourself in the actual situations that cause fear. You have to learn to ride it out enough times, placing yourself in the situation over and over until you can ride it out. It is the commitment to the vision, the decision to change, the willingness to risk yourself that moves you across the gap toward your vision. When you develop a vision of what you want, you create a discrepancy, but you have to commit to your vision by immediately stepping into the gap. Only then does your world become different. When you say, this is what I want, and step into the gap, you begin to see opportunities you did not see before. By committing to what you want, you open yourself up to what is possible. You make yourself available to opportunities. Whereas before you approached things with fear, or hesitation, or judgment, cynicism, or perfectionism, committing to the vision requires taking action towards creating your reality. Taking action is living in the gap, which opens a new dimension of who you can become and what you can do. It provides a new perspective that opens you up to a different reality. Having made the decision to change, you will start to hear and see things through the template of your vision that you never would have heard or seen before. A 
person I knew once was cynical about finding a new job. She had developed a negative perspective about work and believed she was unemployable. She had developed this principle in her life. They'll never hire me. I'm too old. She stopped looking for work and became incredibly unhappy. Deep down, she wanted to work, but felt that she would be rejected, even ridiculed. To protect herself from the rejection, she covered up her fear by creating an act that she was not interested in work. When I was talking to her that there are people looking for work who are thinking they'll never hire me because I'm too young, she laughed and thought that was ridiculous. I pointed out that there are people who believe I don't have enough experience and still others who worry I have too much experience. Using these points to show her that limiting beliefs are what hold her back from finding employment, not lack of skills or age. I attempted to demonstrate that it was only her thinking and expectations holding her back. Could it be that simple? I explained to her that it was just a matter of switching out her thoughts from being not hireable to hireable and taking action by getting out there into the arena and putting herself at risk and facing possible rejection by applying for jobs and interviews. She worked on looking at rejection as a way to get feedback on how to improve things like her resume and her approach to interviewing and not seeing the hiring process and possible rejection as personal. Once she changed her beliefs and took action, she started getting interviews. She developed this perspective that not every employer would find her incapable or too old and eventually she would find the right job opportunity. We made it a game by saying, I am one interview closer to landing that job. And her internal dialogue started out with, they will never hire me, I'm too old, to I hope they hire me. It turned into, I am hireable, and eventually became, I would make a damn good employee. She bolstered her confidence and developed the attitude, is this the right job for me? She went from a pessimistic perspective to an anxious perspective to a self-assured perspective. When she made the shift from doubtful to self-assured she looked better to prospective employers seeing her confidence employers found her to be more attractive as a job candidate and the evidence was the number of job offers she started to get once she understood that her negativity and pessimism were doing to her in terms of limiting her life she made the decision to take on a different perspective about work seeing it as a vehicle to get what she wanted instead of what she called a necessary evil the vision of getting back into the workforce created a template that she began to apply to other areas of her life. When you change your perspective, you get a different view of the world. Seeing things from a more positive viewpoint instead of the old negative judgmental way, the way you may have been seeing the world in the past will allow you to experience what the world has to offer in the way of possibilities. The doubt and fear you experience in the past cause you to avoid certain situations and avoid the risk of committing to an objective. Now you see situations as opportunities for self-mastery. She learned that by changing one dimension of her life, it positively affected other dimensions of her life. She became more confident and her attitude became more positive, her family relationships improved, and her love interest blossomed. Some people don't want to commit to a goal or vision. They don't want to be accountable and blamed for not achieving it. What they say is, how can I commit to something when I'm not sure of the outcome? If you find yourself asking the same question, push past the hesitation, commit to an outsized goal, and then do what you have to do to make the commitment a reality. This is where the change and growth comes from. Rather than committing to a goal, you know for sure you will achieve or where your success is guaranteed Commit to something you are not certain you will achieve, where you don't know what the outcome will be. This means to live in terms of your vision, in terms of the objective you've committed to, with no certainty, with no guarantee, but just doing the work. Yes, committing to something you don't know you can do will entail a certain amount of courage to overcome the discomfort of unpredictability, but it offers a tremendous opportunity for growth and excitement it opens you up to a realm of possibilities it is a perspective shaping experience because you're living in a future oriented way where the next moment has never happened before 
When you live in the world of possibilities, you see that the next moment has not yet occurred, and the next moment is really what you make of it. In other words, you create your life in the next moment. You are living in terms of what is possible, because the next moment is all there is, and you get to decide how to use it. When you live from the perspective that the next moment is all that there is, you realize there is no past to hold you back or future to wait for. You see, each next moment is the only place to create your reality. When you really live in terms of the now and the next moment, then you can begin living in terms of what is possible. This is a positive approach to life. It is also expressive and creative, totally opposite of, I know this is not going to work out and this is going to turn out the same way as it always turns out ever since I was a kid and got frightened or yelled at or criticized. There is no future beyond the next moment, which you create. Yes, we are creating a future. And in many cases, our vision includes a future many, many years away. But we work on this moment by moment. The recognition that there is only now the present moment and the next moment, where the next moment becomes the present moment and continually seeing life this way is a powerful approach to living. In fact, if you approach life by means of only being present and thinking about the very next moment, your attention quickly becomes focused on the now. You realize that there really is no past and there is no future, that the future is uncertain and that there are no guarantees. When you refuse to reflect on the way the world worked yesterday or what happened to you, you are present. There is only certainty in the moment before you are living in terms of your vision, embracing the possibilities of uncertainty. Don't allow your past to decide what is possible. Whenever you begin to think, I know how this is going to work out, so why bother? Take note, you may feel that this is a safe viewpoint because there is certainty to it. Even though you aren't getting what you want, in fact, you may prefer the hopelessness of your current world because there is certainty in this hopelessness. This is a dangerous, limiting viewpoint that it is a repetition of the past. It's hard to believe that people would prefer the negative certainty over an uncertain future that may be positive. The belief that I already know how things are really going to turn out, even though it is negative, is certain and therefore comfortable. The negative certainty of something feels more familiar than the uncertain possible positive. Essentially, the knowledge of pain is comfortable because that is what the person has repeatedly experienced. And we always fall back to what we repeatedly experience. That includes the traumas and other addictions and negative behaviors. You might recognize this pattern if you were ever in a bad relationship and clung on to it or worked in a bad work environment but were afraid to look for another job. Check to see if you have any of these concepts running through some parts of your life. Do your thoughts say, you'd better not? What if you fail? What if you're rejected? Examine this concept of certainty and comfort. See where you thought about doing something but didn't even try or started and gave up because you were not certain you could do it. It could have been the idea of losing weight, exercising, advancing at work, getting a certification, going back to school, asking someone out, or any number of things. Look to see where you have a secret belief such as, it's too late, I'm too old, I might fail, they will laugh at me, or I can't because. These are all indicators of playing it safe, to stay certain, and not taking the risk to expose yourself to unforeseen outcomes. The people who won't make the commitment to do something allow the past to dictate what is possible. They rationalize doing nothing because they know it's going to turn out poorly. They know they are never going to succeed, so why bother? Why even try? They set themselves up in such a way that life becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, they are bringing about the conditions that ensure they won't succeed. And then they say, see, I told you so. Allowing the past to dictate what is possible is one of the primary reasons for continued anger, anxiety, frustration, and self-doubt. It is one of the reasons generations of people continue to live in poverty. They live this way because their parents lived this way like their parents before them. People are out of work because their parents were out of work. The notions of I can't 
is so deeply ingrained in some people, they don't know any other way to live. But it doesn't have to be this way. It starts with realizing you have choices. When people are asked if they want success, they will say yes. However, the idea of success for someone can be daunting, even scary. This is because it means change. They do not have faith in themselves. Part of the problem is that people usually define success as relating to money or fame because society sees this as success. However, is success that big car, money, and a mansion? Let's redefine success so that it's not so daunting. Success, and how we are defining it for this episode, is a way of being in the world, taking actions, and living your life in terms of your vision. When you redefine success as becoming everything you were meant to be as a result of working toward your vision, you'll begin to see the possibilities the world has to offer. You begin to live your life to the fullest. Success is not necessarily reaching the vision as much as it is living from the vision as Neville Goddard would say. You're living from the reality that you imagine. You begin living your life to the full. When you live your life from the blueprint of the vision in the now, as if you had achieved the objective. This means success is living your vision in the moment, doing the things that move you toward your vision, which taps into your potential to develop you into the person you are intended to be. Success is really just being able to live in the gap, in the arena, taking actions in line with your vision. In the context of this definition of success, it's important that once you define the vision, you need to recognize that your actions to achieve this vision may lead to some missteps and strikeouts. However, the missteps and strikeouts are not failures. They're temporary. In fact, missteps and strikeouts are a form of success. They point you to try a different approach. Without mistakes, setbacks, and failures, we do not recognize it's time to change course. It bears repeating. Because it's true, failures and mistakes are learning experiences. They are our best teachers. And we know we're on the path towards success when we're making mistakes and striking out. On the way to the vision, there will be breakthroughs as a result of breakdowns, the mistakes and setbacks. Breakdowns are not permanent. They are only permanent if you stop. By continuing through the breakdowns, you achieve your breakthroughs. People fear mistakes and breakdowns because they think something wrong with them, that they are not up to the task. They fear that they may be ridiculed or laughed at, but so what? No one ever succeeds at anything without failing or making mistakes. The breakdown always points to the breakthrough. If you can accept that the human condition is actually one of continuous breakdowns, you will feel that your mistakes are not personal. They are in fact normal. Look at it this way, the moment you set an objective or create a vision for your reality, because you haven't achieved it yet, you are in a form of breakdown. The intolerance of breakdowns, mistakes and failures comes from early life experiences when the child learned not to tolerate any kind of discomfort, not to tolerate errors and put on a mask of perfection to look good, be well thought of and fit in and accept it. Society frowns upon errors and failure, which reinforces the fear of mistakes and setbacks. Many people have learned and come to believe that the only way to live is to repress themselves and hold on to that perfect image and not make mistakes by not participating, by not risking, by not jumping in the water, by not getting into the arena. This is playing it safe all the time. People do this to ensure satisfactory results, which is a repetition of the past. Unfortunately, when we play it safe and do not participate, we repress some part of ourselves. We don't live the way we really could live. That is, we don't get the opportunity to really experience life. Life is meant to be lived on the edge. Life is about taking risks, risking ourselves, participating to become all we can be. By not participating, living becomes very constrained. It's a very narrow way of living and eventually our existence becomes restrained, tedious, uninspiring. It is safe in one sense, but it is a trap in another. What I'm saying is that life is to be lived to the fullest. This does not mean jumping around from idea to idea and not finishing anything. Nor is it doing crazy things that put your life at risk. And it doesn't mean being irresponsible or self-indulgent or arrogant. 
to really live to the fullest, you have to commit to this larger objective of a vision and then be willing to live in the gap between where you are now and your end point, the vision. And in the process of living in the gap, where every day is taking actions to reach your new reality, be willing to accept errors as a source of information. Use errors as a checkpoint to regroup by asking, what is missing? What else can I do? How can I create a structure of routines and support in which to live that will ensure the result? And in the process, let go of all your perfectionistic behaviors and accept your humanity and vulnerability which is something many of us learn to hide very early in life. Society has conditioned us to hide our thoughts and feelings or risk being judged and criticized. We learn to hide from being uncertain. So we have learned in essence to hide our humanness, our true self. What we're talking about here is letting go of the security of the familiar and being fearful. Let go of the go nowhere cautious approach and instead get out in the world and take risks. This means begin to live in terms of your new reality, the new vision that you have for this reality. Because a vision is an ideal future state. You will need to set incremental objectives aligned to the vision as you would climb a mountain or run a marathon. This way, you will stay motivated and can course correct if needed. By setting clear incremental objectives, you will take on new challenges which will require you to tap into your potential and you move toward mastery. The feeling of stress and anxiety becomes excitement and energy. When you live your vision and take the steps to achieve the incremental objectives that move you closer to that vision, you may feel you are taking risks. It may feel risky because you are entering the unknown doing things you haven't done before. You're speaking up where you were once afraid to state your opinion. You're taking actions you have been avoiding due to the possibility of ridicule. You are doing things in the face of possible failure you have been circumventing. They may come up again. They are not signs to stop. Winston Churchill said it best. When going through hell, don't stop. This is speaking your vision by living it. Let's review some tools that we have at your disposal. You can accept fears and doubts and uncertainties. When anxiety comes up from the fears, doubts and uncertainties, consider these questions. Can you accept it? Instead of fighting it or hiding from it or pushing it down into your subconscious mind, can you write it out? Can you wait it out? Can you recognize that the panic, fear and self-doubt are just an old pattern of behavior and you can write it out and just to get through it? Are you going to master the anxiety or are you going to allow it to continue to master you? The answer has to be that you're going to master it. The way you master anxiety is by doing nothing until it disappears or dissipates or taking action in spite of it. Taking risks and living your vision doesn't mean you are going to be free of the symptoms of doubt, uncertainty, fear or anxiety. You may have to do this any number of times until you get comfortable recognizing the old patterns by telling yourself, there's that old feeling again, but I can get past that. Or you can say to yourself, I can master this. I can go on with my life. The point is that you can go on with what you've set out to do despite all your discomfort and despite the uneasy feelings. You can use affirmations. Affirmations will help you overcome your past and the anxiety but they can also help develop mastery over old beliefs. It can be as simple as creating affirmations such as, I may feel uncomfortable, but I can do it. I am making my life more meaningful and more powerful. I may experience some discomfort, but I can time the discomfort and learn to ride it out. Affirmations work best by constructing them in the three P's, positive, present tense, and personal. It is the best way to write them out every day in a notebook and read them aloud. Another technique you can use is to use thought switching and affirmations together. Another way to let go of old cautious approach of living is to use thought switching. You may have a dialogue of old thoughts replaying in your head. They may be constant or sporadic, like when you're about to do something. Whenever this negative voice comes up, it diminishes your abilities 
to take the action you need to take, especially those actions that are in line with your vision. The negative dialogue sows seeds of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If this happens, use thought switching. Change your old negative thought to positive thought. Replace the thought. If you don't know which thought to replace it with, use the thought of God. Just think about God in that moment. That seems to work for me. Or think about love, if that's easier, if you are triggered by the word God. You cannot stop the recurring negative recordings from replaying in your mind through just sheer willpower. In fact, if you fight the negative thoughts, you can make them stronger and more pervasive, but you can change the content from negative to positive. Essentially, you're replacing the negative thought with a positive one. You simply go from, I can't do this, to, I can do this, or I will do this, or I don't know how to do this yet, but I will learn and I will master it. What I do is if I have a negative thought, I will say the opposite of that thought three times so that I have outnumbered the number of thoughts. You can also use affirmations as replacements. People have changed their lives by combining thought switching with affirmation. They've gone from I can't be a doctor to I am a doctor. From I'm not good enough to I'm positive, upbeat, and optimistic. From I only make 50,000 a year to I earn 300,000 a year. Affirmations are not magic. They just overwrite old negative go nowhere scripts in your mind, much like recording over old tapes. And the next thing that you can do is let go of doubts. Of course, some of you listening to this will say, this sounds so Pollyanna-ish or this is such new age stuff. Some of you likely feel that you're not entitled to create your reality in a new and bolder way. Or you feel you're not entitled to fulfill your wishes. Why should I try this when all my life I've been put down and never given a chance? There may be an underlying feeling that you're not entitled to have your wish fulfilled. This goes on in the minds of many people, but then there's a wishfulness about it too. This wishfulness underscores wanting a certain freedom in life. It is a yearning to be rid of the fear and lead a different life. To get rid of the doubts, you must identify the secondary gains and relinquish them. This yearning to lead a better life requires giving up the benefits of doing nothing. And yes, there are benefits to doing nothing. There always is. You no longer have to endure your problems or conditions, but it means getting a little bit uncomfortable for a short period of time. People want things to change, want to feel or to be free, but they often want a magic formula for change, a quick fix. They're not prepared for the idea that in order to change, in order to have a different reality, they have to let go of an old belief, a way of living, and move toward what they want. They need to let go of beliefs and ideas they have about themselves that are not working for them. This takes time because they've been living this way for years. You must let go of the secondary gain of being convinced that certain situations are going to frighten you. Let go of the fear of making mistakes and failing and ridicule and rejection. Let go of whatever value you get out of thinking you are nice or helpful, as well as all the ways you've been functioning that aren't really who you are to live your life in terms of a larger vision. Identify what is causing the stress and release what is not working. Sometimes people just have to let go of the past, their fears, and who they were and be willing to jump into the water and try to swim. We must learn to let go of any number of things that are causing us stress. Identify what the stresses are and just release them, no matter how much we identify with them. What are you ready to let go of? Maybe it's resentment, anger, or fear. Are there any past grievances that you still hold on to? Are there things that still upset you that happened 10 years ago? Do you believe you're not smart enough? Are you willing to give these up? What we are really talking about is letting go of the past. Even if the past was only 20 seconds ago or as far back as 20 years ago, the question is, can you drop it? Can you dig a hole, throw it in, and just bury your past? And the answer is yes, you can. Most people have a goal or vision underneath their social persona. Do you know what you want? If not, that's okay. It may take a little time to explore what it is you want to pursue as a vision. 
The exploration begins with what you like, what you dislike, where your talents lie, and in general, what your interests are. Some people are not quite sure what vision to adopt or to accept. They say, I can let go of the past, but I really don't know what vision to select for the future. Or I've never had a goal, or I'm not sure what my goal should be. Others feel a specific goal may constrain them. They say, I want to remain flexible to whatever comes my way. Still others have too many ideas, in which case they go off into too many directions. The correct thing for people to do when selecting a vision is to choose one. It really doesn't matter which one, just choose one. It isn't so much what the vision is per se, it's the fact that you're moving and in the process of working toward the vision, the person you become. What defines you, what changes you, is the process of working toward the goal or goals that are bound up in the vision. What I want you to do is create a vision and allow that vision to define you. This strategy of selecting a vision and taking action toward it taps the hidden potential that lies within you. It is a vehicle to get past the outer shell, your facade, to get to that deep layer of spirituality within you. It is the vision that gives you the power to become what you want to be. The vision is a means to get to your inner core, your true self within, to reflect who you are on the outside. Once you've created a vision of what you want, allow the vision to define who you are, replacing erroneous beliefs and concepts of yourself that you may have carried out around all your life. This may be difficult to do because you're reluctant to let go of self-concepts no matter how erroneous and painful they are since they're familiar because you received praises such as you're always willing to sacrifice your time you're so nice you're always available you always agree go along and volunteer and so on the importance of the vision is that it allows you to function in the world from the stand of the vision by having a vision of what you want you can step into the frame of the concept of the vision a picture of it and live from the concept of the future in the now. You create the vision of what you want or who you wish to be, but you act in the present as if you have achieved the outcome with all the desired qualities and attributes aligned with having achieved it. The vision becomes a blueprint, the template for you to live by. Living from the template, you begin looking at the world from this new perspective and choose each action you take based on it. Yes, there may be shortcomings. The vision may not be perfect. However, you don't have to wait to achieve it. Be that person now. It's critical not to make the future more important than the present. Even though you're attempting to create a reality in the future, when you make that future more important than the present, you take away your power and your vision. Use the vision to change behavior. When you select a vision, should it be something challenging? There are no so-called correct answers as to what your vision should be. Ideally, the quest for a vision should be something challenging. However, the word challenging can make the vision sound too difficult or big. People assume that if they establish a vision, it needs to be earth-shaking. It needs to be something lofty, but this is not the case. It ought to be something that really leads you to begin functioning in quite a different way than you have been accustomed to. For example, Simply decide to lose weight is a worthy goal because it is something we can relate to and we know what's involved. Let's use the vision of losing weight to demonstrate what the steps might be to achieving it. As a vision, losing a certain amount of weight might become, I want to become a thinner person. This way of restating the vision allows you to live from the vision. From this vision, you begin living as a thin person lives. What this means is you step into the frame by doing what thin people do. You eat what thin people eat. You move like thin people move. You have a refrigerator full of what thin people have to eat. You begin living out of the vision while at the same time you identify what others have done to achieve the same goal. You create a blueprint of what people who were successful did. You find that they break their vision into smaller goals, whether they're trying to lose weight, compete in the Olympics, run a marathon, or go to medical school. They set incremental goals. They did not say, I'm going to lose 90 pounds in six months. Start with the question, what you can do? Can you lose one pound per week? The answer, in all probability, is yes. 
Now you may say that is not a challenge. This is not a lofty purpose, but you see it is. It's changing the old behavior. It's saying I no longer want to function in the world in this way. At the same time, it is also saying I want to live in the world in this new way. So now there's a gap between where you're at and where you want to be. You may say, okay, I'm going to commit to losing a pound a week, but I've been on diets for the last 15 years, or I can't seem to lose weight, or I yo-yo, or other things similar to these. What the person is saying is, I've tried to do this before and it hasn't worked. This is the skeptical voice in your mind. You will find this voice coming up to shoot down any goal you're trying to achieve. Everyone has this voice. Everyone. Just work past it. What makes this approach different is that you're living out of the vision with the aim of losing one pound per week as one of the goals. What also makes this approach different is you start at the end point, the future vision of the desired state, to determine the steps you have to take to get there, you create a blueprint. When you look backwards from the attainment of the vision, you can clearly see what you need to do to reach it. I want to be a thin person becomes I am a thin person now. This allows you to see the actions you took to get there. This becomes a template for living and changing behavior. You see you need to change eating habits. You see you need to cut back on the calories. You don't go out to eat as much. You cut back to smaller portions. You see that you need to begin an exercise regimen. You do not sit in front of the TV for hours. You no longer consume sweets. You don't have snacks. You eat better. You drink more water. You take walks after dinner. When you see what you need to do to live your vision, you are designing a new structure of support. You see you need to hang out around people who have a similar goal. You empty your refrigerator of ice cream. You toss out the candy, the cookies, the potato chips from your pantry. You keep healthy foods around. You read about health. You develop other interests aligned with being a thin person. You commit to the vision and modify your thoughts. You create affirmations. I am a thin person. I eat healthy foods. I exercise daily. I love to exercise. When you get hunger pains, you already have a plan in place. You know they are normal and to get through them, you ride them out. You don't fight the pain or the stress. You ride it out. You time the discomfort and soon you find out that the anxiety is not really a big deal. You use thought switching and you see yourself as a thin person. You go for a walk instead of eating. By living your vision, you see yourself as a thin person. You begin moving as if you were already a thin person. You do what thin people do. You assume that you are thin. You eat better. You work out more and enjoy the process. You allow the vision to redefine you. The vision defines the way in which you function in the world. You become the person now. You act as if you were the person you wish to be. This drastically changes how you function compared to the past. So let's kind of review what needs to be done to achieve a vision using the example of the thin person. First, you create a vision. I want to lose 90 pounds. That feels punishing. I want to be a thin person. That's a better vision. Then second, you break the vision down into smaller goals. You don't look at a vision of losing 90 pounds. You develop a goal that is a stretch, but something you can achieve. Instead of looking at losing the entire 90, which looks impossible, you break the amount down to a more rational number you can achieve. The idea is you make a small incremental change that you can achieve, but is still a stretch. This leads to the question, what are the actions you need to take to achieve the incremental objectives? You break the incremental objectives down into how you function. You look at what your diet entails, what you're eating, you get into the details and specifics. For example, can you commit to eating only one muffin a day as opposed to eating two? If you took the elevator before, now you go take the stairs. If you sit around watching TV, now you go for a walk. These are things that are easy to do that makes the diet possible. The smaller goal is workable, feasible, and start acting as if it is achievable. Committing to losing one pound each week is very different from committing to losing the entire 90 pounds. The idea of losing a pound a week is something that you can believe in. It keeps you motivated and you can see where you went off course. Third, you use the vision to guide your behavior. The vision is the template through which you see the world. You state, I want a reality where I live as a thin person. What do thin people do? You use that end point of the vision and trace the steps you would have taken to get back to the present moment. 
What did you have to do to reach that vision? You now see the world differently. You eat less, you stopped snacking, you develop exercise programs, you bought running shoes, you join a support group, and so on. You list out the steps necessary to accomplish it and use them to develop your plan. And then you live from this plan. You use the future to define the actions that you need to take now in the present moment. The vision defines your actions in the moment. Then to keep you on track, you use the question, is what I'm about to do in line with what I want? You can modify the question and make it, is what I'm about to eat going to help me or hurt me? The vision becomes your guide as to what steps you need to take and how to live in the present moment. It redefines how you see the world. If you've committed to the vision, then you're going to look at ice cream and cheesecake quite differently than before. The vision guides your behavior. Would a thin person eat this? Yes or no? Is this what a thin person does? Is this in alignment with my vision? However, if you're operating out of the belief, I don't know if I can, I don't think I can, or I'm afraid I won't be able to, then you haven't really focused on the little half-step measures that it takes to move you toward the vision. All you need to do is focus on are the incremental objectives and their related steps leading to your vision. Fourth, design a structure of support. You design a structure of support, things you need to do, how you function, how you will live to achieve the vision. You design new routines that support your goal, so you do not have to think about what to do next. The structure and routines keep you on track and from veering off course. It starts each morning when you get out of bed. You have a routine, you put on your running shoes in the morning and exercise. You only eat at certain times of the day. You only have a healthy food in your house. You eat off smaller plates. You don't have sweets in the house. You go for a walk after dinner. You hang out with like-minded people. You create a structure of support, people, routines, goals, and behaviors designed so you do just what you need to do. The structure supports the template from which you live in order to make the vision a reality. This means giving up the sense of I can't. It's giving up your thoughts of what you did in the past. You have to be on guard or against the thoughts like, why should it work this time or I'm going to fail again? And fifth, relinquish the past to create a new world. The critical thing in setting up a vision is to let go of the past. The past in most cases works against you. This means not allowing the past to pull you back. Relinquish the past. Relinquish the fearful and superstitious notions you have about yourself based on the past. Create a completely new way of being in the world. This is what reality creation is about. Establish a vision of the future and commit to it. Committing to it is about living in the present from the stand of the vision and using it as a guide for making decisions and taking responsibility for choosing the behavior that eventually produces the outcomes you want. In the spiritual community, particularly with Neville Goddard, sometimes there's this sort of magical belief. You sit right before you go to bed and you imagine what it is you want. And then as Neville tells us, a bridge of incidents brings you right to that vision. But oftentimes that bridge of incidents requires that you act out of a vision. And more and more, this magical thinking works against people. People don't leave their house. They sit on their couch and wait for things to happen. When I talk to them, they're not actually doing anything towards that vision of reality that they're creating. You are creating your reality with your thoughts. That is the most important step. And in some cases, it can happen without you taking any action. But in many cases, it simply requires some level of action. And in most cases, it requires you to move into a zone that's a little bit uncomfortable, that may cause a little bit of anxiousness because it requires change. And if you can embrace this and create a vision, wonderful things will happen. So I recommend that you get your notebook out, you describe your vision, something that you're willing to commit to. And then on another page, detail what you're willing to give up from the past in order for you to commit to the vision. Are there old concepts to give up? Principles, excuses, beliefs, secondary gains. On another page, work backward from the vision to determine the steps that you need to take on the way to the vision. Work backwards in the, from the bridge of incidents that will happen in your own case that you can move towards. And then design a structure for the fulfillment of your goal. 
What needs to be done to reach the vision? What would you need to have in place? What do you need to do? What do you need to stop doing? Who are the people you need to meet and associate with? What routines do you need to put in place? How do you structure your life? What's needed? What's defined? What's required in order to produce the vision? It is all available to you. All you need to do is understand that you can create any reality, any possibility is available to you. There is no excuse you can make. It doesn't matter how old you are or what you've experienced in your past. You can create your own reality. And when you go through this process of creating a vision, it gives you a template to act towards and wonderful things will happen. Now is the time for you to create a vision. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com And welcome to The Reality Revolution.